Okay, let's see if I can do this. Annyeonghaseyo. Today we're gonna be talking about K-pop. Oh god, that was probably so bad. Annyeonghaseyo. Today we're gonna be talking about K-pop. <laughs> In my last video, I talked about the whole thin spo, thin as in eating disorder thing that's going on right now. A lot of you guys were talking about K-pop in the comments saying that you think that thin spo and the resurgence of being skinty has a lot to do with K-pop and the rise of K-pop in the Western world. So today I'm going to be talking about K-pop in all of its entirety, the good, the bad, the... Mosengin. 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 You know, K-pop idols go through a lot in their careers and even before their careers even start. And they are under a lot of control and strict contracts. There's things they're not allowed to do, say, or eat. I could never be a K-pop idol for, well, many reasons. But one of them being because I talk very candidly about things that not everybody is willing to talk about or allowed to talk about if you're a K-pop idol in this scenario. This video is sponsored by Balesa. Today's video is sponsored by Balesa. Balesa is a bi woman company made for all things sexuality. Balesa's mission is to empower everyone to explore, celebrate, and embrace their own sexuality. And Balesa can help you explore your sexuality for free if you enter my giveaway. My friends and I from Balesa are literally sending free toys or gift cards for toys to everyone who signs up. All you have to do is click the link and sign up. It sounds too good to be true, but I promise it's real. Literally everybody wins something. Balesa sent me a few of their toys and I'm going to tell you about them right now. So first we have the pebble, which comes with a suction designed to fit in the palm of your hand easily like this. And there are no annoying pattern modes either. I like the size of it. It's very small and and quite discreet and I like the color because it's pink then we've got the air vibe which comes in this nice little charging case and it looks like this it has dual stimulation and it's waterproof as well as very silent in the notes it says silent but deadly I like that silent but deadly and then we've got the demi wand which is personally my favorite just because of the shape look it looks like a wand bippity boppity boop i'm gonna bippity boppity boop you into an orgasm i'm just kidding i mean unless it's consensual of course i don't know dm me or something this is again made for all body types and is whisper quiet and this one also comes in a nice compact discreet case in case you need to you know pop it in your purse if you're uh doing big o's on the go going to a, a party where this would be necessary i don't know what you get up to on the weekends and it also has an adjustable neck so it can be manipulated to whatever angle or pressure you would like no pattern modes on this one and it's also usb rechargeable and waterproof and lastly we've got the finger pro which honestly what a contraption i love this little thing this has 105 textured silicone rods on the tip we can do a little asmr do you hear that? This has one button, but 10 different modes. It's really, it's a bargain, truly. And this is made with medical grade silicone as well. So if you want a free toy, all you have to do is click the link in the description. Everyone who signs up for my giveaway with Balesa wins something. So really, you have nothing to lose. I mean, it's it's quite literally a steal. Back to the video. Thank you and good night. The birthplace of popular Korean music is a place called Itaewon in Seoul, South Korea. This is a district that's really well known for its nightlife and music. It's also located near a U.S. military base. And in the 60s, there are a lot of U.S. soldiers in Korea. And during that time, emerging rock bands would perform for these Americans since that was their preferred music at the time. Korea was was under a dictatorship and went through severe military control, which included the ban of playing and listening to rock music. The government dictated what was going to be played on radio, and more importantly, what couldn't be played musically. It was very much the dark ages. However, in the late 80s, Korea went through a major cultural shift yet again after the Olympics. We must get uh, real democracy. 
They had become a global nation and the perception of the world really changed for Korean people. During this time, European and American music started to play in clubs that were popular in Itaewon. And because of this, artists in Korea started to be influenced by outside Western music. In the 90s, a group called Solid released their first record that was heavily influenced by R&B and hip hop in the US. The first album didn't do very well because this genre of music was not popular in Korea at the time. The popular music was trot music. This music is considered the country music of Korea or the music your parents would listen to. In Korea, they would call it trotu. Trotu means trot, or in another way, it's called bongjak. So you have the bongjak melody going. That melodical aspect played a big, huge role in the song to make it hit. The emphasis of melody was very, very big. Like what I realized was like the melodies were, it was moving up and down a lot. With the combination of Pongjak, R&B, and hip-hop music, they were able to garner a lot of success from their sophomore album. They were the first group in Korea to successfully merge Eastern and Western music together that was palatable to Korean people. So essentially, they paved the way or laid the groundwork for K-pop. Then Seotaeji and Boys came out, and that really created a huge splash within the Korean pop world. And I think it's safe to say that their music really set the tone for what we call K-pop now or represents modern K-pop. They were dancing and rapping, which was very new to Koreans at the time. When they made their debut and were performing on television for judges to score them, they actually received very low scores because the judges were not familiar with the style of singing and dancing, and they questioned if their music was music at all. Uh, but that didn't really seem to matter because they really resonated with the Korean youth at the time and were one of the biggest groups in Korea of all time. So from the start, K-pop has been heavily inspired and relied on black music that was coming from the States. And still to this day, hip-hop and R&B are huge components of K-pop. Although the K-pop that we hear now, I think has its own distinct sound to it that is very K-pop. As I was doing my research for this video, I was wondering if if any of the kids who listen to K-pop actually listen to hip-hop, rap, and R&B. Because most of the people I've met who like K-pop don't really listen to hip-hop or R&B by black artists. Maybe it's because of the lyrics, you know? Some people don't like the lyrics that are featured in hip-hop music because of how degrading it can be towards women, as we all know. But something K-pop and American hip-hop have in common is n****. Maybe that's why white people like it so much, because they can say n without getting in trouble. Nigga, what did you just say? Say, oh no, see, it's fine. They're not actually saying, they're saying, nigga. Sorry. I had to do it. Anyway, so let's talk about H.O.T. Now, H.O.T. is very, very, very important in the story of K-pop. They introduced the idea of idol groups, which is pretty much all of K-pop now, aside from the solo artists. New Kids on the Block were the main inspiration and model for H.O.T. H.O.T. and S.E.S., which was the girl group equivalent of H.O.T., which was created by SM Entertainment a year later, are pretty much the blueprints for groups like BTS and Blackpink. K-pop really started to grow in popularity in other countries in Asia like Taiwan, Hong Kong, and China. Then towards 2009-ish, that's when it started to grow in the U.S. Wonder Girls was, I believe, the first band to target the U.S. audience, more so than the Korean audience, which kind of caused issues in their career because their Korean fans felt a bit neglected. 2009 was a very, very big year for K-pop, especially for the girl groups. With the advancement of technology, and social media at this time as well. It was a lot easier for foreigners to hear about K-pop and become fans. K-pop is a huge, huge, huge industry. It's estimated to bring in about $10 billion to Korea every year. So I'm not a K-pop stan, but from what I've learned about it, it seems quite expensive to be a K-pop fan. I mean, you've got all these CD collectibles and concert tickets, and sometimes people fly to see their favorite groups live. I mean, are people, are you going into debt? Is that how it works? Are people taking out loans just to fund their K-pop 
hobby i don't even want to say interest it's more than just an interest it's really it seems like a like a lifestyle even the merch for k-pop is so lucrative that korea is the only country that has managed to double their cd sales since the introduction of streaming so now that i did a very brief history about k-pop you should watch the youtube original series if you want more details on how k-pop started now we're going to talk about how the industry works because it is very different from how the hollywood system in the u.s works in the u.s we're used to artists kind of developing themselves and then becoming discovered then signing to a major label and becoming huge stars. But in Korea, K-pop idols are built from the ground up by the label. So what happens is they will recruit members from other failed groups or they will hold auditions for their next idol group. The label will form a tentative group and then they will go through training for about two to three years, sometimes even more. But throughout this training, which I will dive deeper into the training of it all, but during the training, they learn how to sing, act, and dance, and they will go through through evaluations about every month or so to see how they've progressed. And then there's a final evaluation and through that they will sometimes cut members and they will then form the official group. Once the group is officially formed then they will do a lot of television performances to build hype around this new group and then they'll release an original song and a music video which would be their debut. With each comeback as they would call it or each era of a k-pop group there's usually a brand new aesthetic and sound paired with this new era. Although artists in the West try to switch up their look and sound with every era, it's generally pretty consistent throughout their career, whereas with K-pop groups, each comeback can be vastly different from each other. And of course, the concept for each comeback is determined by the label. One year you could be making girly, upbeat, bubblegum pop music, and the next year you're making gothic heavy metal music. Just kidding. I don't know if it's that drastic, but I do know that they tend to have a pretty stark difference from each other. And sometimes, I mean, I think groups will do like two or three albums in a year if I'm not mistaken. Another thing that I find really interesting about K-pop is the subunits. So there can be a K-pop group, right? And then within that group, there can be like one, two, maybe three subunits of that group that have a handful of the members from the original group. So for example, Luna has three subunits. There's Luna one out of three or one three, and then there's Luna odd eye circle, and then there's Luna YYXY. So now that I've given Given you an understanding of what K-pop is. Now I want to talk about what goes into actually making a K-pop group and all of the dirty details that come with being a K-pop idol because wow, there's a lot. There's a lot. Now I just want to say obviously K-pop has brought people a lot of happiness and joy. I mean the K-pop stands really, really love K-pop and I think that's really cool that, you know, they've been able to combine Eastern and Western music together to create this new genre that can be enjoyed all around the world. These K-pop idols work very, very hard to a point where honestly I think it's not ethical, but they work very hard and they're very talented people. And I really admire that because although the way the K-pop industry is set up, it really feels like they are producing idols in a factory. And I don't mean that to diss the artists. I really mean it to diss the record executives who treat these people like literal cattle and objects. It kind of reminds me of going to the military because, you know, you go to the training, right? And you live your family and you are with these other people who have also made this decision to become idols. And just like the military, you're sacrificing your body to be used for this greater good. But instead of sacrificing your body to your country, you're sacrificing your body to the K-pop industry. But yeah, so training. Usually it spans from two to three years at minimum, but some people stay in training for up to a decade. They go through very very rigorous training where they learn how to sing, dance, and act. And a lot of the times they will rehearse for hours and hours and hours, like from dusk till dawn. A lot of the interviews I watched for my research, a lot of people said, yeah, we would rehearse until the sun came up. We rehearsed until the next day. And that, that seems to be uh, the common work hours for K-pop idols and trainees. And although they do have vocal lessons, being vocally competent isn't necessarily a priority. Making a love together. Making a love together. 
다 객관적인 가수로 어, 너무 잘한다라고 그렇게 볼 수는 없어요. 그러니까 그런 그룹은 또 사실 없고요. 아 근데 노래를 잘하는 친구도 있어요. 네. 그... Usually within every group, there's like one good singer, and then there's like a rapper, and then there's like the pretty one or the visual who is supposed to bring in more fans because they're like the prettiest of the group, and then there's like the sweet one or the nice one. So not every single person has to be the best singer, and a lot of times, like they're really not that talented at singing. I don't think they would like win a singing competition. But my theory is because K-pop is such a visual. Genre that singing isn't always that important, whereas like dancing is super super important. I tried to find a number of how many people audition to be in a K-pop group every year, and I couldn't really find one. But it seems to be around the hundreds or even thousands of people are auditioning to be in these K-pop groups. And you know, there's like about a point one percent chance of you entering a group, and there's a point one percent chance that you will debut, and a point one percent chance that you. Will even be popular. The training process is extremely stressful for the trainees, and a lot of them tend to develop anxiety disorders during this training. 의외로 이렇게 여러분들은 다 우울하다 이렇게 점수를 많이 매기셨어요. 아, 네. 너무 우울한 말? 제일 우울해 보여. 표혜미 양은 혹시 몸 불편한 데 없었어요? <웃음> 이혜빈 양은 좀그 다른 분보다 좀 쉽게 불안을 느끼시는 것 같아요. 네. 네. They're so worried about their debut and whether they're going to make it or not. And because a lot of these people choose training over going to college, they don't know what they're going to do with their lives if they don't become a K-pop idol. 학교를 중간에 사퇴를 했거든요. 그래서 이거 말고는 정말 다른 미래가 있을까 저를 걸고 목숨을 걸고 하고 있는데 그럼 목숨 걸고 하는 사람은 뭐 같아? K-pop trainees also tend to develop depression during their training as well because they're so tired and so overworked with extreme long hours and a lot of stress. They have trouble finding any sort of peace or happiness in their lives. They don't have time to hang out with their friends or their families. They're away from their families and they're around people that they don't know. And although these people are not alone and they have their members, a lot of the times these members are pitted against each other because it is a competition at the end of the day. Even if you're within the group, you're competing with your members. And I can imagine that is extremely isolating. These people are practicing and practicing day in and day out, oftentimes being heavily reprimanded by the higher ups, like the executives and the choreographers and their managers. The entertainment company is quite hard on these people and you really have to have a thick skin to survive. During training. Wannabe idols go through training and all of their love for performing and music has completely been drained out of them because they don't even have enough sugar in their bloodstream to remember their names, let alone have the brain capacity to like dream, have hopes, aspirations. And I think a lot of these people end up being very depressed because of that reason as well. They realize that what they wanted and what they dreamed of doesn't actually exist and it's way more grueling than they were expecting. <laughs> Kaiser 
욕만 엄청 먹고 불안감이 있었을 때가 데뷔 전에 연습생을 할 때보다 사실 많은 대중의 사랑을 받는다라는 일이 너무나 감사한 일이지만 또 굉장히 벅차는 일이거든요. 침대에 누워서 잘수 있는 시간이 뭐한 2시간, 3시간일 때도 있었고 특히나 음악 방송을 할 때는 이제 새벽부터 나가서 드라이 리허설하고 카메라 리허설하고 리허설도 중간중간에 계속 인터뷰라든지 또 어떤 예능 촬영들이 있고 어떡하지? 나 너무 아픈데 나 그냥 진짜 기절해서 자고 싶어 이런 생각을 했던 것 같아요 다들 왜 우린 기절 안 해? <웃음> 기절 좀 해봐 <웃음> 무대에서 넘어지면 그냥 일어나지 마 <웃음> I think what also makes K-pop so incredibly competitive is the fact that it has a disposable nature to it. There are a lot of members per group compared to groups in the U.S. where it's usually about four, maybe five. But in Korea, these groups can have seven, eight, even like 12 people in a group. And I think because of that large number, it's almost like they're disposable. If one girl keeps showing up late to rehearsal, she's cut and replaced with somebody else. If one girl can't get the choreography right, they can find someone else who can do it better. Not to mention, once they debut, that doesn't guarantee success, right? And a K-pop group could completely flop from the beginning and never have a chance to grow from there. And their group is just disbanded and their career is over before it even started. I think the disposable nature of K-pop also contributes to the abuse that happens behind the scenes because a lot of people, especially women who are the victims of this abuse, will put up with being severely mistreated because they know that they'll just get replaced if they don't put up with it. So you made it past the training and you still have the will to live. Congratulations. Now let's sign this contract, basically signing your whole life away. K-pop contracts are truly something else, or as what some would refer to as slave contracts. So there are a lot of things that K-pop idols can't do. They aren't allowed to date or even really associate with anyone from the opposite sex. I was already 31 or 32 in Korean age. I did have a girlfriend at the time and I came out with it and our company decided to kick me out of my group. And probably same sex too. I seriously can't imagine that the general public of Korea is like down with gay people. Um, I could be wrong, but which begs the question: Are there any like? K-pop artists who are suspected to be gay. I'm just wondering if there are actual K-pop idols who are gay, but they try to hide it, but like the fans kind of know. Anyway, here are some other things that K-pop stars aren't allowed to talk about. Politics, religion, sex. They're also not allowed to smoke. Smoking is really, really looked down upon and it's not something that an idol should be doing because they're supposed to be, you know, a good role model for the kids or whatever. There have actually been like a couple of scandals involving idols who smoke. Kind of reminds me of that time when Zayn Malik was caught smoking cigarettes and a bunch of 12 year olds were like, he's gonna die. And if you are a YG rookie, which uh, YG is YG Entertainment, which is one of the major entertainment companies in Korea, the YG rookies are actually banned from going to clubs and bars. Since these contracts are so intense and so strict and extremely unethical, a lot of entertainment companies have been sued by their idols because of these contracts. They sue for a plethora of reasons, whether it's overall mistreatment or mismanagement, deteriorating health and lack of care from the agency, harsh working conditions, scheduling events without the idol's consent, blocking them from pursuing acting, as well as underpaying or straight up stealing money from these idols. I never complained about not having enough money, but the lawsuit did cost a lot. Because I wasn't ever paid by the agency, I sold my collection of sneakers and paid off the fees. I stayed with my parents for the time being. I went back to the newspaper distribution office where I worked in my high school days. The owner knew 
I debuted as a celebrity. He asked me why I'm trying to deliver newspapers again. I laughed it off and told him it was to get some exercise because I wasn't promoting anything at the time. I couldn't tell the truth. Like that, I was delivering newspapers again. That's really wild to me because although the same can happen in the US and has happened, it just goes to show you how fickle a K-pop career can be. The agency controls your image and will not let you do the things you want. An idol must place the agency and group above himself. I think this mentality also stems from the collectivism of Eastern culture because in the West, it's a very individualized society. We care about ourselves and being our own unique individual, but in places like Korea, being a part of a collective and serving for the collective is what is most important. And it's quite selfish to put your needs before others. And it, and so I think that's why a lot of these Korean artists tend to face a lot of abuse because they know I have to do this for my group. I have to sacrifice my needs and my comfort for the better of my group or for my agency. BAP signed a contract in March 2011 with a duration of seven years. They claimed that they only got a salary in July. July 2014, amounting to 17,901, which is around $16,000 per member. If it is calculated for three years since their contract was signed, it means that every member of BAP gets a salary of around $450. Although the cost of living, such as food and shelter, has been borne by the agency, the amount is considered to be very incomparable to the hard work they have done. Even BAP also claims to have received poor treatment and health, such as paying for hospital fees with their own money and being forced to appear even though they would have attached a sick letter from a doctor. So if an artist chooses to leave their company, they can be financially penalized and it's usually the amount that the company invested into you or your group. So the penalty can be up to like a hundred thousand dollars. In March 2017, the Korean Fair Trade Commission released a report on these contracts, ordering Korea's leading talent management agencies to stop forcing unfair contracts on their trainees. Reports were made following the report. Companies are no longer able to impose excessive contract cancellation fees and are unable to force artists to renew their contracts. They are also unable to cancel contracts immediately without notice or for ambiguous reasons and unable to force trainees to pay penalties immediately. So it's no secret that Korean beauty standards are quite high, especially for K-pop idols, and they are very, very unattainable even for the K-pop stars themselves. Plastic surgery tends to be quite common in Korea, and although I don't think most K-pop stars are super open about the surgery that they get, I think a lot of them do tend to get surgery because they're also very highly, highly criticized by people on the internet and people from their agencies and record labels. And so, you know, if you say, oh, their face is too big or their mouth isn't heart-shaped enough, then they'll go get surgery to correct those things so they can have more success careers. You can't necessarily force someone to get plastic surgery, but it can be encouraged and a lot of times they will go through with it so they can please their agency or just reduce some of the criticism they get online about how they look. There's so much pressure to be perfect, to be the best dancer, to be the prettiest, to be the skinniest. Extreme dieting is also very common within the K-pop industry for K-pop idols, especially women. It really amazes me how extreme their diets can be because every single time I watch a video about training, weight always comes up. There were times when I was training that I felt like instead of being a good singer or a good dancer, how skinny you were would secure your spot in a group. And they have this pressure to lose as much weight as they can and be as skinny as possible because that's what is a part of the beauty standard in Korea, especially for K-pop idols who are supposed to be these like larger than life deity type people. I mean, they're called idols for a reason, right? And so with all that pressure... I can imagine, like, of course these people are depressed. They're running on empty literally all the time. Imagine running up a mountain from sunrise to sunset with nothing but a slice of apple in your stomach and a dream. There's this thing called the IU diet, which is named after the idol who popularized this diet. She famously would only eat one apple, two sweet potatoes, and a protein drink per day. Okay, my camera died, but we're back. Where were we? So something that I found during my research for actually 
my last video was the association with thinspo and k-pop idols i found a lot of videos on tiktok where people would post the amount of calories they ate that day or whatever small amount of food they ate that day and in the background was usually a k-pop idol who was also very skinny and i believe a lot of these people who are restricting take inspiration from the k-pop idols who openly share their extreme diets which is why i think people in the comments of my last video were saying that they think that k-pop is responsible for a lot of the thin spo and ed culture coming back up <laughs> <gasps> These people are obviously working very hard and have very physically demanding jobs so if anyone should be eating and getting sustenance and nutrition it's them but unfortunately because of the beauty standard and the culture around women's bodies in korea they are left to just be running constantly with no fuel and there are plenty of videos of k-pop stars literally passing out while they're performing because they're just not eating one girl in an interview that i watched said that because they had to show off their abs a lot they wouldn't even drink water until their performance because just a little bit of water would make them bloat. I don't understand why these executives and agencies expect these human bodies to work unlike human bodies and to work like machines. You do have to feed something and order it for it to live. And if they're expecting these great performances from these K-pop idols and expecting a long lasting career, I don't understand why they just drive them into the ground and use them like damn tissues. At this point, it seems like all you really need to do to be a K-pop artist is just to be skinny as hell and like maybe be able to do is two stuff. You don't even really have to be able to sing like, oh, it's okay, you're tone deaf, that's totally fine, nothing auto-tune can't fix, but auto-tune can't fix that muffin top, so maybe hit the gym and stop eating for a few days, okay, hun? I think also a reason why they tend to overwork these idols is again because they see them as disposable and easily replaceable. I would honestly say that becoming a K-pop idol or training to be a K-pop idol is something that is very detrimental to your physical and mental well-being. In a documentary I watched for this video, there was one scene where the manager, I guess, was driving really reckless and the idol members ended up in the hospital from a car accident. And they were really banged up. I mean, they had bruises on their leg. One girl even had a sling and the next day they were in rehearsals performing like nothing happened sling included. They're literally like not allowed to sleep. It doesn't make any sense to me. This one girl in the documentary was really sick and she went into like a back room during rehearsal so their chief director wouldn't see them and she was literally hiding from him because she was sick and she didn't want him to know. <laughs> And a lot of K-pop idols, like many celebrities, experience a lot of cyberbullying, but I want to say it's worse for K-pop idols. I, I think maybe the Korean media is a bit more harsh, especially if a K-pop star has uh, gained weight or has a nose that doesn't look like the other members or something really minute like that. Um, I think Lisa from Blackpink went through this because she is the only Thai girl, and I want to say that in Eastern Asia, Thai people um, experience a lot of like, I don't know if you'd call it racism, but like xenophobia maybe. But what breaks my heart is whenever I watch these documentaries or during the training, they always go, well, you know, once I, once I make my debut, I'll be happy. Once I make it to the debut, I'll be happy. But I don't think that's really the case. I mean, putting your happiness in one event that may or may not happen is already going to be bad enough. But even if it does happen, you are still going to have the same schedule, if not worse, if you guys actually find success and all the problems 
that you have now are just going to be exasperated once you become famous and then you have the public to also worry about. So for those of you who don't know, there was a Korean singer named Suli who was a part of the group FX. She was known for being very outspoken about mental health and the struggles that she went through as a woman being in the K-pop industry. In 2019, she unfortunately did pass away due to... Um, I don't know if I'm just gonna bleep it out and she is not the only k-pop artist who has done this um, unfortunately I don't want to say it's common but it has happened a handful of times where a k-pop idol has unalived themselves because of the pressure and the depression and anxiety that they went through they also have to deal with unfortunately just like in the u.s k-pop idols especially female k-pop idols have been targeted by predators within the industry jang ja yun who was an actress also passed away after committing and before she died she left a list of about 20 men who had assaulted her in the past during her career she also revealed that her agency forced her to sleep with a man and unfortunately none of the men who she exposed have been charged for their crimes so if you're a k-pop fan or familiar with korean media then you probably have heard of the burning sun scandal this shit is really disturbing so i'm just warning you now so in 2019 a man was at the burning sun club where he witnessed a woman being assaulted on the dance floor while she was intoxicated. He tried to stop it, but unfortunately, he was kicked out of the club and brutally beaten by both the staff and the police. He did speak out about this injustice and he was able to get over 200,000 petitions to get the government involved and to launch an investigation on the club. So Sung Ri, former member of Big Bang, was the club director as well as a shareholder in the club. And he claims he wasn't there, so it's not really his fault whatever whatever but he is a huge part in this and pretty much the face of the burning sun incident so sung ri was a k-pop idol he then retired after the controversy and the same day he announced his retirement another former k-pop member by the name of jung jun young was also a huge part and probably the worst perpetrator of this entire scandal he was exposed for exchanging illegal videos of him taking advantage of unconscious women and sending it and in chat rooms with other k-pop idols and there were female k-pop idols who were being assaulted in these videos as well the whole incident is honestly like so truly disgusting and disturbing if you want to learn more about it there are plenty of videos on youtube i watched this one it just goes to show you that there is a very dark seedy underbelly when it comes to k-pop just like almost every industry but the entertainment industry tends to attract terrible people like these guys and i think the reason that is is truly because of the money like although the nature of the burning sun incident was somewhat unique to korea because there is a big webcam issue this is unfortunately something that seems to happen all over the world i mean we had the me too movement in the u.s and it's just so depressing knowing that like wherever you go you're just always going to potentially be a target but the entertainment industry especially in korea is so 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 lucrative like i said it generates over 10 billion dollars a year to the country of korea and when so much money is involved it's just bound to attract corrupt people and to cause corruption within that industry when the university of rome opened a class on the mafia people said you need to understand the organization to better understand italy likewise you need to understand the triangular mafia in korea of celebrities businessmen and public authorities to fully understand korea there clearly is a tie between these celebrities public figures policemen and businessmen in korea because through the burning sun scandal we can see that the police definitely had a connection with these business owners and celebrities because they literally battered this guy for telling them that there was a woman being assaulted which is a fucking crime and because of this money they're able to buy silence or buy allegiance to people who are supposed to be protecting the people of korea by offering up the celebrities the police have satisfied the public and taken the spotlight off the police it's easy for celebrities to be involved because once they get the most famous person behind bars then it's kind of like oh okay we're done here the bad guy has been locked up sung ri had like three years of jail time which really is not that long for all the terrible things they did actually i can read the long egregious list of all the charges that were made during the burning sun scandal mediating or purchasing 
habitual or overseas gambling, illegal currency transaction, business operation violations, instigating violence, embezzlement, taking or sharing illegal images, tax evasion, habitual drug use, drug smuggling and distribution, bribing police officials, accepting bribes, misuse of power, and sex are so basically, he's done every crime under the sun. I mean, a better question would be, what did he not do? Jaywalking. Anyway, Stan Luna. So yeah, I think I've covered most things. And uh, if you like pop music and you're looking for something new to listen to, consider pre-saving my song Missing Out out November 11th, 2022. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's a banger. It's so good. It's actually really good. It's so good. Listen to it. When it's out, of course. There may or may not be some visuals as well. And if you would like more content from me, I have a Patreon. I just uploaded a podcast with my friend Joy and we talk about the power of delusion. So if you want to be a K-pop idol, then maybe you should listen to that. It's actually quite encouraging though. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Baby, you couldn't let me be when I was